Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our very first webinar for the GHIT PDP's webinar series, session one with MMV, developing life-saving antimalarials through global partnerships. We are pleased to have you from all over the world today. I am Eriko Koyama of GHIT Fund, and I'll be the moderator of this webinar today. Here is the overview of today's session. And please allow me to give you some guidance about the webinar before we start. Today's session will be conducted in English, but we also have a simultaneous translation to Japanese available. If you wish to listen to this webinar in Japanese, please choose Japanese from the interpretation box on your right hand corner. Feel free to send your questions anytime during this webinar via the Q&A box also at the right hand corner. We also accept questions in Japanese. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session towards the end of this webinar. If you have any technical issues, please contact the email address indicated. And um, please allow me to introduce the panelists, uh, which is Dr. James Duffy from MMV, Medicines for Malaria Venture, Professor Tomo Nozaki from the University of Tokyo, Mr. Hiroaki Kano from Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma Corporation, and Dr. Kei Katsuno from GHIT Fund. We would like to start this webinar today with a brief introduction to PDPs. The Product Development Partnerships, which is to be presented by Dr. Katsuno. Katsuno-san, if you're ready, please unmute yourself and start your presentation. Sure. Um, thank you for the introduction. Okay, here we go. Um, can you see the slide? Okay. Um, so thank you for the introduction again. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, as the title of the webinar suggests, we'll be focusing on product development partnerships or PDPs um, and their collaboration with Japanese entities and GHIT. And some of you might already know the work of PDPs. And for those who are not familiar with them, I would like to briefly explain what PDPs really are uh, in the next couple of slides. And as many of you are aware, there has been little or very limited financial incentives to develop medicines for neglected diseases, um, as opposed to other lucrative markets, so to speak, um, such as oncology or non-communicable diseases. And as a matter of fact, some sub reports suggest that only 1%, 1% of medicines developed target neglected diseases or diseases endemic in low income countries, um, as you can see on the left hand side of the slide. And in the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, various stakeholders came together to create new models uh, to ad address global health needs. And that's exactly how um, PDPs were created. Uh, PDP is a general term that refers to these entities and the entities listed on the left-hand side are examples of PDPs. And, uh, let's, and this is how PDPs work. Um, PDPs are, again, nonprofit organizations that work closely with multiple sectors, uh, such as governments, private sector companies, uh, philanthropic organizations, and researchers, so on and so forth, to really advance innovations that tackle infectious diseases in low- and middle-income countries. And as you can see here, uh, their work is truly based on partnerships with these various entities across multiple sectors. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, here, here are some of the key results brought about by PDPs. Um, if you look at the period from 2010 to 2020, uh, there have been 66 products developed by PDPs, and it is estimated that um, these products have reached more than 2.4 billion people in low and middle income countries. And also there are uh, 375 new products in development at this point. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that PDPs have helped strengthen health systems in disease endemic countries, and their efforts continue in close alignment with the United Nations SDGs. 
Um, many of the slides that I showed so far were taken from the Keeping the Promise report by the PDP coalition members. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for their generosity. In the last few slides, um, I'd like to explain the work of PDPs from GHEAT's standpoint. Um, here's our current portfolio and, oops, sorry. Um, this particular slide, um, as you can see, many of the projects are based on partnerships between PDPs and various Japanese organizations. Um, with the long lasting turmoil caused, uh, caused by COVID-19, uh, the roles of PDPs are now even more critical for advancing global health R&D especially for neglected diseases. Uh, with that in mind, we are truly grateful for, for having one of the PDP's um, MMV or Medicines for Malaria Venture and its Jap Japanese collabor collaborators, both from academia and industry to speak about their work and partnerships. And I'm very much excited about their presentations myself and I hope they will provide a great opportunity for all of you, or well, actually for all of us to learn about uh, the work of PDPs and ex explore potential future partnerships and collaborations. Um, thank you very much again. And um, I'll hand this back to Koyama san Thank you, Katsuno san, for the introduction to PDPs. I think it was very helpful for all the, all the listeners. And as our second panelist, um, we would like to invite Dr. James Duffy from MMV. And uh, he will be presenting um, to you today to provide you some insights about MMB and their R&D work. James, if you could, uh, you have already turned your, turned your mic on. So if you could start your presentation when you're ready. Okay. Well, um, let me just share my screen. And whilst I'm doing that, I'd like to thank uh, G Hit and Kay and Erico for inviting me to this presentation, to this webinar, and for giving me the opportunity to to present uh, the, the work that uh, MMB does uh, in partnership with all of our collaborators. So in the next 20 minutes, I will try and give you um, a brief introduction to malaria uh, and the human impact of this terrible disease. A little bit about the work of MMB and our partners and about how we, how we carry out the, the activities that we do and um, also, and importantly, about the contributions and learnings from our collaboration with GHIT uh, and our Japanese partners. And this is a significant collaboration, a significant contribution. So let me, let me start with my presentation. Okay. So I probably don't need to, to, to repeat this, but I will. Um, the human impact of malaria is, is terrible. Uh, malaria still uh, takes the life of a child every two minutes and uh, can kill within 24 hours of the first diagnosis of the symptoms. Almost half the world's population lives under the shadow of malaria in, in regions of the world where the malaria par parasite and the, and the vector um, is able to survive. The economic impact of malaria has been enormous uh, throughout the the history of humanity and it still deprives African countries where the disease is most prevalent of an estimated uh, uh, 10 to 30 billion uh, dollars every year. Um, resistance to malaria has always been a feature of the parasite and its survival uh, and uh, drug resistance to the frontline anti-malarials uh, um, is occurring in Southeast Asia. This is where um, resistance to the older original anti-malarial drugs first originated and it's origin and it's happening again and when um, resistance to the um, the older mal anti-malarial such as chloroquine um, happened and this resistance reached uh, Africa the impact on the the, the 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 population there was terrible and the increase in the disease was 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 tremendous um, and with drug resistance is it is a biological um, inevitability. And um, for this reason, the development of new anti-malarials is as critical now as it ever was. And last but not least, um, malaria is both a cause and a consequence of poverty, and it predominantly affects the most vulnerable of populations, such as pregnant women and children. 
The global health community has long been dreaming of a, a malaria-free world. The WHO has been thinking of this since the middle of the last century. Um, and incredible progress has been made uh, towards malaria uh, elimination and ultimately eradication. Um, uh, since uh, the um, start of MMV, the beginning of MMV's launch, um, malaria mortality has decreased from about a million deaths a year to about 400,000 deaths a year. However, this increase is now, is now plateauing. And we reach a crossroads in, 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 our, in our strategy and our fight against malaria. Um, if we were simply to let the existing uh, therapies and control mechanisms, um, and we, weren't to, we were just to stay with them, um, ultimately they will fail and we'll see a resurgence. If we manage these carefully, we may be able to contain the disease uh, still at a terrible level that is really unacceptable um, within these communities. To, to actually move towards elimination and ultimately eradication, um, we, we need to strengthen our existing malaria controls, uh, improve management of the drugs we do use and uh, the use of control mechanisms and all the available tools and knowledge that we have from the, from the, from the last uh, you know, 50 years. However, we also need to stimulate the R&D pipeline. We need new malaria medicines, new malaria vaccines, and new mosquito control tools for, for it, uh, in spraying and for, for bed nets. And this requires uh, new funding from malaria endemic countries and, uh, and donors. So MMV is a PDP, and uh, thanks to Kay for his uh, clear introduction and uh, his excellent introduction to, the, to why PDPs exist and, and what our operating model is. So Medicines for Malaria Venture, MMV, was launched in 1999, and our mission is to discover, develop, and deliver new uh, and effective and affordable anti-malarial drugs. And as I said before, especially focused on vulnerable populations in disease endemic countries. Um, we're not, uh, our, our organization doesn't have the objective to provide new medicines for travelers um, from, uh, from Western Europe or North America or Japan to, to disease endemic regions uh, and nor, nor for the military use. Um, we are focused on small molecule antimalarials. Other organizations and PDPs operate in the vaccine space. Um, so our organization focuses on new small molecule antimalarials. And as Kay said, whilst the antimalarial drug market is enormous um, in terms of the actual patient population, it's incredibly small in terms of the profit. So following the PDP model, MMV shares the costs and the risks of drug development with our partners and makes anti-malarial drug research happen. And as uh, Kay highlighted in his presentation, um, this is through uh, uh, a number of, of, of attributes of PDPs that make us a, a, an excellent vehicle for doing this. We have in-depth expertise in, in, in our case in malaria, and we have a strong drug pipeline. Um, this is supported by uh, strong contracts that, that allow all partners to know what their expectations are, what the deliverables will be, what the framework on which they operate in, and what they ultimately will be expected to get out of the collaboration. Um, because of our knowledge of malaria and the fact that we are wired into, into the, uh, the, the global health community in terms of malaria, we know what the goals are. We know what the patient populations need. We know what the clinicians need. Um, we know what the, what the regional, national, international organizations are looking for. And we can bring this all together. Um, and we're able to, to support this by leveraging donor funds and in-kind support. Many, uh, all, of the, all of the partners that we have that I'll show in later slides have, have given in-kind contributions to the malaria project. So not just, not just the fund, direct funding from an organization like GHIP, but the, the, the partner organizations give their expertise, their assays, their knowledge. Uh, and this uh, really does boost the output of, of, of what we can achieve if we were just doing it ourselves. And this relies on a global partnership network. Um, MMV is a virtual organization. I'm speaking to you from Geneva in Switzerland um, and our offices are located there, but we have no laboratories there. Our laboratories are everywhere and everywhere where our partners work um, across, across the globe. And by tapping into this network, um, 
we really have access to state-of-the-art assays, the, the cutting edge technologies and science, and, and um, we can do this without uh, repetition and duplication of effort. So it makes it a very cost-effective model for carrying out drug research. Um, so now to, now to, to, to move on to anti-malarial drug discovery. And um, I, I work in the discovery uh, department within Medicines for Malaria Venture, and this is everything from uh, target identification, screening, hit to lead, lead optimization, all the way to delivering clinical candidates. And this is the profile, the target product profile that we that we have for new anti-malarial drugs. Um, uh, in some ways, anti-malarial drug discovery has many advantages. We have very good assays. We have a very good translation between the assays that we carry out uh, in a test tube, if you like, in a laboratory. Uh, and uh, we have very strong animal models and we can use the same parasites in the test tube, if, in the animal, and then in human volunteers. And so we see a strong correlation between, between what we actually see in a, in a in vitro setting and what we will actually see in a clinical setting. So we have many advantages in terms of our assays that have been developed over many, many, many years. However, we do have significant challenges. We, as I said, we need new drugs for treatment and for pro protection. And these drugs need to be fast acting. Malaria, uh, as I said, uh, following identification or observation of the symptoms can lead to death within 24 hours. So the drugs must be fast acting and bring down the parasitemia very, very rapidly. They need to be long duration. Um, currently people have to take um, daily regimes uh, at least three days for the frontline ACTs. Um, for prophylaxis, you may have to take it daily for, for a much longer period. So we need long duration drugs that provide that provide efficacious concentrations of the of the active in, um, drug until you've eliminated all the parasites or until you've provided protection um, for a significant period of time. Um, this can be um, for for treatment. This can this could be uh, four to six days, um, uh, and for pro prophylaxis, ideally this would be up for a month, for a, as long as a month. And we need this to be in a low dose. Um, this is really for patient compliance, for the cost of goods. Um, um, all anti-malarial uh, medicines are a, are a combination therapy of two, potentially more medicines. So we need to have low oral dose. We can't have people taking uh, uh, grams of medicine in, in this case. Um, as I uh, discussed uh, in an earlier slide, we need to be efficacious against all known field resistance and have a low propensity for generating resistance. Um, so these are drugs that, that work against all circulating strains and have a low propensity for these strains developing new resistance to those drugs. And finally, these must be developed as a cheap fixed dose child friendly combination combination. We need to think of the patient population. And so this is uh, needs to be low cost. Uh, less, we target less than a dollar a day for adults and less than a quarter of a dollar for infants under two years. And there may no, must be no contraindication for use by children and women of childbearing potential. So malaria drug discovery, as I said, has some advantages, but there are lots of challenges. And this is why we need new drugs, new medicines, new partners to work on with them. And this is really why MMV wanted to, to access uh, Japanese innovation. We have always been aware that uh, Japanese scientists have an unparalleled track record in infectious disease drug discovery for many, many, many years. And many of the, the frontline and, and first in class uh, infectious disease drugs uh, originate from Japan, Japanese laboratories and from Japanese scientists. We knew that Japanese organizations have access to uh, novel compound libraries. And for this reason, MMV was very, has always been keen to, to engage with Japanese partners. However, before GHIT, we had very limited success. Uh, we weren't well known in Japan. Uh, our, our mission wasn't well known by Japanese scientists, and we didn't have the, 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 the ability to, to have the right contacts within Japanese organizations. So we were absolutely uh, delighted when, uh, when GHIT was formed. Uh, and GHIT has helped connect us to potential partners, helped us to build relationships, and helped us to break, develop understanding. And, you know, examples of this, GHIT provides, uh, those of you who have um, 
perhaps apply for funding through GHIPS, very clear requests for proposals that are clear in terms of the format, the information that needs to be provided, the work plan. And this allows, um, uh, allows the very best projects to be funded. Um, in addition, it manages the portfolio. It has developed milestone criteria and gives excellent project go governance. So, you know, GHIT has really revolutionized um, the relationship between PDPs and Japanese um, organizations interested in infectious disease drug discovery. And, and it finally, and certainly um, not least, uh, the organization, the GHIT organization provided uh, to MMV incredibly generous, incredibly generous funding. So, what what has been the what has been the results of, of of this of this collaboration between MMV, GHIT, and our Japanese partners? Well, as you can see, since 2013, when uh, we were first able to apply for for GHIT project funding, um, we have steadily increased our portfolio. You know, now we have uh, currently about 14 projects that that GHIT is contributing to at the moment that we're working on with Japanese partners. Um, as those of you who have um, worked with GHIT know, in the discovery space, they fund everything from target research, uh, screening, hit to lead, and lead optimization or product development. And you can see a, a steady evolution in the in the number of projects in all the phases. You know, starting off with screens, and then the hit to lead projects, and these hit to lead projects um, developing into lead optimization or product development platform projects. And this is this is uh, excellent, and it is. Um, can be attributed to the strength of the projects, the strength of the, the chemical series that have um, been used on the projects, and and the the, the strong working relationship um, between MMVG HIT and the Japanese partners. We have now screened uh, over half a million compounds from uh, Japan, and this includes isolated natural products, um, and this has resulted in. Uh, five hit to lead projects and two product development projects. Other projects have come into our portfolio at a later stage, but just, just from screening, which is one thing that MMV really wanted to do, you can see we've screened compounds, we've got hit to lead projects, and these have developed into lead optimization projects. And these have been novel and very high value in terms of their potential uh, as, as treatments and as, 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 protect, as uh, prophylaxis. Uh, drug targets, including lipid kinases, uh, tRNA synthetases and enzymes. So we've really worked on some of the very best targets uh, with some of the very best compounds. And we now have um, four projects with uh, good potential to deliver drug candidates uh, next year and the following year. So this is really um, shows nicely how the projects have evolved, the phase of the projects have evolved, um, the targets that we've identified have been the targets that we've wanted to work on and we are very hopeful that the, the first um, projects that the first uh, new drug candidates that um, originate from this collaboration will start to um, move into uh, clinical development in the next few years. Um, I, I guess I guess no one can really, especially working in, in global health and infectious diseases, can give a presentation without uh, reflecting on the the impact of the the current pandemic and of COVID nineteen, um, from the very start of the of, of the pandemic, uh, um, the global health community knew that this had potential to to lead to a significant impact on all um, all global health diseases and especially malaria, and and we predicted. That, uh, that we would almost see a doubling of the lives lost due to a disruption in, in the health infrastructure, the availability of drugs, the availability of diagnosis, uh, and, uh, and uh, the availability of funding for this. And the initial data, and this was released by Global Fund um, uh, earlier this year. Um, so just to explain these graphs, um, uh, that yet the yellow line, 0% would be, um, no impact of malaria. And then what you can actually see is the actual, in the orange line below that, the comparison between uh, what is observed um, in 2019 and what was observed at the end of 2020. And you can see we were diagnosing fewer cases and we we're distributing fewer treatment medicines. Um, and this, this inevitably has had an impact on the number of deaths and wholly avoidable deaths of um, due to malaria. 
However, there is another, I guess, strength of the PDP model is that um, medicines for malaria venture are focused on malaria and we will always be focused on malaria. Um, but we are, um, are able to, to work beyond our target disease. So we have knowledge and we have tools and we have experience of, of doing this. So a couple of examples is that, um, first of all, MMV has always been able to catalyze drug discovery by providing um, boxes of, of compounds, either small sets of compounds with known activity um, against, our first boxes were compounds with activity against malaria. Subsequent to that, we've released boxes of compounds uh, with activity against pathogens um, and um, uh, also against antivirals. And most recently, we, in response to COVID-19, we released the COVID box, which was a set of uh, 80 compounds with predicted activity against SARS-CoV-2. And these boxes were, um, were purchased by MMV, were formatted by MMV and our partners, and were made available to researchers free of charge to actually uh, catalyze drug discovery against, um, to identify new antivirals with potential effect against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and subsequent to that, we worked with partners on, on multiple COVID-19 clinical trials, including the REACT and Anticov trial, uh, where we provided compounds and uh, expertise in running clinical trials in infectious diseases. In addition to this, um, and this obviously is different to the discovery space that we operate in, um, PDPs do build uh, capacity to strengthen healthcare systems. And um, it meant that we, and healthcare uh, workers that we had helped to support training were able to um, use the knowledge that they had in terms of malaria projects to use that for COVID-19 in, in terms of testing, in terms of diagnosis, in terms of healthcare advice. And indeed, um, state-of-the-art uh, clinical trials facilities that MMV and our partners have supported the creation of in, in Africa um, were, and the staff that worked there were used for COVID-19 testing to give examples of, of how PDPs, um, when, when needed, uh, can, can, can work and can um, make a positive contribution outside of their specific disease focus. So, a few minutes left. So just to, just, just to, just to end uh, my presentation, I really thought um, I'd like to talk about some of the learnings from the partners. Um, so I've shown in the previous slides, the screening Japanese compounds has done what we hoped it would do. And we've identified novel chemicals, uh, novel compounds and novel drug targets. The Japanese partners have given uh, excellent drug discovery and development. I haven't talked about the development uh, areas of our projects, but um, certainly uh, we have had projects that have been supported by GHIT in the development space, and maybe I'll have the opportunity to talk about these at another webinar. And, uh, and here GHIP have, and the Japanese partners have provided excellent advice and input in terms of safety, CMC, uh, manufacturing. Um, I believe very strongly from, since I've worked with Japanese partners since 2015, and I believe that the project teams and the projects that we've worked with see the value of working on NTD projects, even if their, their day job is focusing on, on um, uh, uh, other disease areas, oncology or, or uh, cardiovascular diseases, CNS diseases, they see the value of NTD projects, neglected and tropical disease projects, and they built productive project teams with uh, great respect between all of the partners, the Japanese partners, MMV, a uh, network of test centers. The GHIP framework has enabled good decision making. As you can see, not all of our projects uh, would result in candidates. Uh, and this is an inevitability of drug discovery, as, as, as you all know. However, the framework that we have has enabled swift decision making. We don't, uh, the projects with potential continue, the projects um, that, uh, that uh, are unlikely to deliver drug, uh, drug candidates, uh, we, we stop. And this, this is really down to the GHIT's open innovation culture. And this has meant that we've had lots of different configurations of project teams, um, some with the Japanese partners contributing all the science, some with the science being outsourced, some with some combination between the two. So this is really just a great way of working. Um, we work how the, how the project and how the project teams can. And so my last, really, really few last slides, just to sort of highlight the opportunities for new partners. So if any of you haven't worked with, uh, with GHIT or with MMV and thinking this would be a good opportunity, 
we're interested in in many new projects so target-based projects um you know new malaria drug targets as well as screening against the whole uh the whole parasite phenotypic projects we want projects with potential for prophylaxis as well as for treatment and we really want projects that have have the vision of um of treating uh mothers and babies as as a real goal so the challenge is we need new mechanism of action uh compounds with low drug resistance uh compounds with low drug duration and compounds with pediatric and maternal drug safety. Add opportunities. We would love to work with partners who have expertise in machine learning and artificial intelligence, partners with new drug targets and a target ID, and um, in line with the challenges, uh, partners who have expertise in, in developing low clearance compounds with the assays to assess that and development of preclinical assays to, to assess reprotoxicity. Um, teratogenicity and, and other, um, uh, other safety concerns. And there are many, many benefits for partners uh, to work in this kind of environment. Uh, not only know-how, patents, research tools, um, there's financing, as I said, from GHIT from, and from MMV. Uh, uh, you access our scientific and access expertise. Uh, it allows organizations to expand their R&D capacity in infectious diseases, which uh, strengthens reputation um, in the global health com community. And ultimately, uh, uh, drug candidates and uh, drugs that are actually approved uh, have the possibility to qualify for incentive schemes. And really, this is my, is my last slide. Everything that I've talked about here has been done in partnership. And it would be impossible without, without the support of the GHIP Fund and with all of these partners that we've collaborated on. Hopefully I'll be able to give this presentation in, a, in another few years and these partners will still be there, uh, but the slide will be bigger and there'll be more partners because um, I, we really strongly believe that all organizations have something to contribute uh, to, this, to this, uh, uh, this fight. And um, without the contribution of these, we wouldn't have achieved anything that we haven't, that I've discussed. Um, everything that MMV does and has done over the last 20 years, all of our successes and all of the all of the impacts that the MMV has made on on fighting against malaria has been done through partnership and will always be done through partnership. And so thank you uh, very much for your attention. Apologies for overrunning by a few minutes. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, James, for your really kind presentation. From an introduction to malaria, um, to MMV's R&D work by, the, by your global network to fight against malaria, as well as the impact to respond to COVID-19 uh, as, uh, as a PDP. It was, it was very helpful to listen to. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to invite our next speaker. And... Um, Yes, the Professor Tomo Nozaki from University of Tokyo about his work in collaboration with MMV and other PDPs. Nozaki says, if, um, please turn on your, yes, your camera is on. And I think you're also unmuted. And if I just may and ask all the audiences to feel free to use a Q&A Q box uh, once again to address any questions you have. So Nozaki says, if, please kindly start your presentation. Okay, I just want to make sure that the uh, you can see my slide all right and you can hear my voice. Yes, I can see your slide and I can clearly hear your voice. Thank you. Okay, that's great. All right, uh, I want to start my presentation by thanking thanking uh, Jihit Fund uh, for invitation, and I'm happy to share uh, our experience with MMB uh, for our uh, early uh, phase uh, drug develop discovery and development for of the antimalarials uh, through PDPs. So the, uh, my presentation is basically based on uh, two uh, projects. Uh, one is starting with the screening platform started 2018 for two years, uh, followed by um, uh, the hit to lead platform, uh, which started only a couple of uh, months ago. So basically uh, this is the collaboration uh, 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 domestic collaboration with uh, Nagoya Institute of Technology and Nagasaki University and also uh, Drug Discovery Initiative, University of Tokyo, uh, with international collaborators, of course, MMP, uh, uh, particularly Jeremy Burroughs and James Duffy and Paul Willis. 
And I want to uh, share uh, my, our experience, particularly with the Japanese young researchers working and interested in uh, 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 drug development against malaria, three, three, uh, big three, as well as uh, other infectious diseases, including NTDs. Uh, briefly, let me introduce my, myself. Uh, my name is Tama Nozaki, and I'm here at the Department of Biomedical Chemistry uh, Graduate School of Medicine at the University of Tokyo. Uh, myself is the um, MD, PhD, uh, graduated from Keio University uh, 30 years ago. And the, um, I can say that uh, my specialty is molecular parasitology, working on entamoeba, plasmodium, trypanosomes, and leishmania. Uh, my major interests include metabolism, pathogenesis, evolution, as well as drug development. So basically, I'm a parasitologist uh, with expertise, particularly in the area of molecular parasitology. And the, I don't know if it's appropriate to add this last sentence, but the, uh, my dream and my um, crosstalk with the tropical disease uh, was created when I was a medical student. I simply wanted to be a doctor in Amazon, Brazil. And uh, just in case you are interested in our research, I just uh, copy and pasted some of uh, our major contributions in metabolism, pathogenesis, evolution, drug development. So I know that Eriko is gonna uh, put uh, our presentation in uh, GHIT homepage. So if you're interested in our research, please refer to those articles. So I'm here to share our experience and explain you uh, how we started uh, this collaboration with MMB funded by GHIT Fund. So about seven years ago, I would say, uh, when we intended to start, initiate our new drug discovery campaign, situation was as follows. A majority of screening projects were conducted only by a pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, using their own uh, compound libraries. And there are very few projects from Japanese academia. And even in such a case, only a limited set of their uh, either university or institution owned natural compounds and their derivatives are mainly tested against malaria or other, other NTDs, neglected tropical diseases. So we thought, uh, why don't we use the academia-owned chemical libraries uh, for the same objective? So that's how uh, we started. Um, well, that's because we have expertise, enough ex expertise in molecular parasitology. And we are very much keen on developing uh, 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 medicines against malaria and other parasitic diseases. Uh, we had excellent target, in other words, enzyme-based uh, or uh, uh, phenotypic cell-based assays running in the laboratory. And uh, we have a good access to the structurally defined chemical and even natural microbial culture growth libraries for drug screening. So uh, the things which are missing in, 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 my, in my view at the stage was we, we really need good external help from someone who really understand and know how to make a drugs uh, from uh, early uh, hit or lead as, uh, after the screening. So we need to help the chemists uh, chemistries and preclinical development, including safety testing, pharmacokinetics, drug metabolisms, and pharmacodynamics, and AD, AD uh, adsorptions, uh, uh, dis, uh, distributions, metabolism, and excretions. And uh, above all, I felt pretty much that we really need a good compass for directions. And in other words, we need a good collaborative network all the above. Then we started searching of potential collaborators and funding resources. And we found GHIT call for proposal. Uh, and, and we realized that GHIT is gonna help us to combining and, and uh, letting us meet with uh, PDPs. So in our screening project, we aimed at and in, in, in the co consequent, subsequent projects, we are still aiming at 
the discovery and optimizing of the new compounds that are efficacious against plasmodium falciparum, and also have a new structure, scaffold, and importantly, a novel mechanism of action. And I don't want to echo what uh, uh, James Duffy uh, uh, kindly presented in, in, in his presentations, a desire the properties uh, of the new antimalarials or forums listed here. And importantly, we want to discover and optimize the new compound efficacious against malaria from Japan made structural defined chemical libraries. So uh, we uh, decided to use a compound library uh, readily available at the University of Tokyo, more specifically, Drug Discovery Initiative DDI. And they had uh, 210,000 compounds. And this library uh, is mainly uh, composed of the uh, diversity, uh, fragment, uh, and scaffold uh, libraries. They also have a part, in part, uh, the focused libraries are targeting like the kinases, the GPCRs, and ion channels. So we decide that to uh, use a standard assay, which is uh, standard serine pfaluciparum, it is sort of acidic states three D of the three D seven strains on three hundred eighty six well microtiter plate using a lactate dehydrogenase or cyber green assays. And those three uh, great researchers are, are participated in the screening and and validations of, of the hit compounds. So this is the uh, result of assay evaluation, validations, and assay uh, of screenings, and the, uh, some parameters uh, uh, for evaluation of assay is good. Z prime factor is usually above 0.7, and signal background profile is usually better than three. So depending upon the uh, selection criteria, uh, for instance, if we take 90% inhibition at the concentration uh, to micromolar, uh, we have gotten uh, close to 1,000 uh, primary actives out of uh, 200, 210,000 uh, compounds. Uh, so this is going to give us uh, active uh, hit rate of 90% of inhibition to micromolar, about 0.5% which sounded uh, quite reasonable when we finished the uh, primary screening. After that, uh, we uh, 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 carried out uh, the secondary confirmatory assay using two assays. One is lactate dehydrogenase assay, and also cyber green assay, which uh, uh, visualized DNA to make sure DNA uh, genome was, was degraded by the compound. So we uh, narrowed down uh, uh, the actives to about two thirds. And with the tertiary assay, uh, we used a Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast, uh, the hydro uh, oral de dehydrogenase expressing 3D7 strain. We did it uh, because uh, we didn't want to have overlapping inhibitors against plasmodium falciparum DHODH because there are quite many candidates already in the pipeline. So we are uh, suggested to include this tertiary assay uh, by Jeremy Barrows uh, when we proposed this to, to GHIT fund. In the quaternary assay, uh, we included drug-resistant DD2 uh, cell line to make sure our hits, our actives are still active against uh, DD2, uh, fluorokin and pedimesamine uh, 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 SP uh, resistant cell line. So we ended up with about uh, 500 actives. So at this stage, uh, we completed uh, the, the first two years of our screening projects and, conclude, and concluded we have enough number of hits to go on uh, to propose some, some really interesting uh, candidates uh, for the second stage of the uh, uh, hit to lead uh, platform. So we asked James uh, uh, Duffy at uh, NMB at the stage. Uh, uh, so James, we have to prioritize a few candidates out of 400 actives. So uh, NMB kindly uh, applied a few methods uh, to exclude and narrow down the candidates. One criteria is the uh, no malaria drug fragment included in, the, in our actives. 
So no overlap with no antimalarial structures. Secondly, uh, we have to look for structural nobility. Otherwise, similarity index is less than 0.7 uh, compared against all the compounds registered in MMB database, uh, which significantly reduced the number to 106. And we have this, we decided to determine IC50 against PF3D7 and EC50 against uh, uh, human uh, hepatic uh, carcinoma cell, FG2. And the uh, setting a safety index, in other words, ratio of IC50 over EC50 is 10. So we selected uh, uh, compounds. And we further uh, prioritized uh, by uh, the potency against CD7 and also desire the physical chemical properties and safety index and also structural love using a software application called star drop multi-parameter optimization. So we narrow down the candidates to 44, including 11 commercially available and 33 non-commercially available uh, uh, potential actives. Finally, and most very importantly, we requested a four directors at MMB, all of whom are uh, chemists, uh, ask for selection uh, based on chemical attractive attractiveness. So I'm parasitologist. I don't know anything about chemical attractiveness. So we just simply uh, uh, believed what they said. So they picked up eight chemically attractive compounds, which is suitable for the downstream drug development, including four commercially available and four non-commercially available compounds. And finally, we decided to pick up three commercially available and one non-commercially available active uh, compound. And this is, so here we are at the end, uh, at, at, the, at the right uh, top side, the end of screening project. And we propose to GHIT fund for HIT to lead a, a platform uh, last October, last year. And we, at the same time, we started profiling of those four HITs, four actives. So uh, on the right panel that the active and heat profiling methods are detailed, and I'm not gonna go through this, but for instance, it's important to make sure our actives are active against throughout life cycle, preferably, uh, but the prefer uh, uh, preferentially that you know, we, we uh, want to prioritize the actives which have the liver stage activity or transmission blocking activity. And uh, ideally, a uh, rate of kill is fast, so it had, had bad, better be the fast killer of the parasite. And, uh, uh, and there, there shouldn't be a, no overlap uh, with the uh, mechanism of action. So we uh, run the heat deconvolution using drug resistance trains to make sure to exclude the potential that, that the actives uh, target uh, uh, like uh, cyclic amine uh, uh, resistant locus. Uh, phosphatidyl inositol for kinase and acetylcholine synthetase and ATP4 and DHODH and also uh, mitochondrial electron transport chain, including a BC1 complex. And also, uh, we also pay attention to the stability uh, uh, when incubated with a liver microsome fraction. Okay, and cytotoxicity against uh, several uh, human cell lines, cardiotoxicity by e e H -E -R -G, et cetera. So we are here at the end of it set now. So we are here in the process of completing uh, this active profiling and started uh, making new array of the new compounds derivatives. So we are in, the, in this cycle right now, try to optimize structured by a chemical synthesis. So I'm, I'm very sorry that we cannot share the structure of three main series uh, we are working on right now uh, due to uh, a, a property, uh, 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 intellectual property issue. I can simply say those three series have a good lipophilicity, a lipophobicity balance. Mm -hmm. And it also has a reasonable kinetic solubility, soluble in water. Uh, so they are good as a starting actives. And importantly, the series one to three inhibit none of the following known targets, as I mentioned, DHODH, et cetera. 
And we have completed uh, uh, the panel of the profiling. And I'm not going through this, but I'm going to highlight some of them in the next slide. So series one, for instance, have advantage of the activity against liver stage. And it seems to be quite stable uh, metabolically. So it won't be broken by, by incubation with uh, liver microsome fraction. And series two and series three are fast killer. So it, if it kills a parasite within 24 hours, very, very fast. And series two has a sexual stage activity. Sexual three has a liver stage activity. At the same time, we have lots of issues. We have to improve potency because a none of series one to three has an ex, not yet has excellent efficacy at like a tens of nanomolar of IC50 yet. And we also need to define structure activity relationship, SAR. And we need to identify minimal pharmacore for series two. And we have to address liabilities in a new molecules because series three seems to be unprecedented. And as indicated at the bottom, we have already created number of derivatives synthesized. Okay, so to summarize, so, so we are still in the very early phase because the project is going to continue next uh, 18 months. So to summarize, so University of Tokyo and MMP screen DDI library, Japanese academia owned the chemical library of 210,000 compounds and identified three to four candidates uh, which advanced to hit to lead uh, uh, this uh, development. And structure optimization, as well as the uh, profiling of improved actives are underway. So finally, this is the last slide I'm gonna show. So I just summarize benefit of PDPs and future perspective from academia point of view. So we have directly gained, and I actually did gaining, and we'll gain lots of knowledge and expertise on antimalarial drug development and also drug development against other infectious diseases in general from MMB. And also we do that indirectly via liaison with the experts in pharmaceutical industries and other international partners. And MMB really help and bridges the gap between academia and industries and also within academia, parasitologists with other people like the chemists by promoting networking and helping us be connected with experts with necessary disciplines. And this is also important point, number three, MMB really provides young researchers an opportunity uh, to be exposed to the outside the laboratory because we are scientists, we are researchers, we tend to stay in the laboratory and not exposed. So I believe young researchers have a lots of experience and at the same time, so lots of encouragement from MMB and also had a lot of excitement and feeling that what they are doing is being realized. That's important. And finally, that we parasitologists in academia also need to create a broader network covering natural and synthetic chemistry, safety, and even regulatory science. So we really cannot stay there. You have to reach out or you have to broaden your knowledge. Uh, perspective from my point of view, we are looking forward to good progress of our structurally optimized initial leads to lead optimization in a year and a half and preclinical uh, platform in three, four years. And my final request to GHIT Fund and PDP is it, please help us in connecting academia with pharmaceutical industry, industries and even contract research organizations, CROs. So finally, uh, without my collaborators, uh, we really cannot stay here uh, where we are now. So I want to thank them all. Thank you. I'm sorry for the over time and I I'll finish my presentations and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Nozaki for, for presenting on your work and learnings from working with MMB in screening academia on chemical library and also sharing your, um, your dream when you when you were the young doctor, it was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, not at all. So next, we would like to move on to the third panelist that we have today. Um, it will be Mr. Hiroki Kano from Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma Corporation. So Kano-san, thank you for unmuting yourself already. So please start your presentation when you're ready.
can you my, hear my voice or can you see my desktop yes. sharing? Yes, uh, we can see your screen and also um, we can clearly hear voice. Thank you. I could a uh, little a uh, moment. My desktop doesn't work well. No problem. Please take your time. It's okay. Yes. Now we can see your presentation. Okay, I can. Now I'd like to start. Thank you for very much kind introduction. I'm a, I'm a Hiroki Kano from the project leader of Jinshi Fan Supportive Collaboration of Mitsubishi Transformer MTPC. My background is medicinal chemistry, and my career is mainly focused on the early stage of drug discovery. Uh, for example, uh, <coughs> screening library strategy and heat triage and so on. Um, uh, this is uh, my first experience to drug discovery for infectious, um, infectious disease. It's a great honor to be given uh, such opportunity to introduce our activities, to introduce, uh, to contribute to global health. I uh, really appreciate the heat fund team. Uh, this is from our company website. It shows our role in so society and contribution to SDGs. Access to healthcare is added a new matter in our midterm plan. Access to healthcare is consisted with two main components. One is a challenge to rare disease, that is our current, the most important research and business area. For example, large cover for ALS treatment have been have already been launched from MTPC. The other one is today's topics challenge to tropical infectious disease. Uh, this is new our company slogan. In short, our mission is to deliver drugs for all patients who need drugs. Of course, tropical infectious disease CRS program in developing countries is included in our scope. But it is not easy. These are a lot of big challenge for us because we don't have any experience and know-how in such therapeutic areas. And in addition, our budget and FTE is limited. So open innovation and collaboration is an effective approach. It is a very effective scheme for us to collaborate with PDPs, professionals for the tropical infection disease research and development using financial support from GHIT Fund. This shows a brief summary of our collaborations for tropical infectious disease supported by GHIT Fund. We, MTPC, have already done HDS campaigns for all G hit fund focus targets, malaria, tuberculosis, and NTDs. Unfortunately, uh, it was unsuccessful to obtain promising hit compounds for tuberculosis HDS by collaboration with TB Alliance. Other two collaboration with MLB for malaria and DNDI for NTDs, Chagas disease, and Leishmaniasis are undergoing. Today, I would, like to, I would like to mainly introduce our collaboration with, for new anti-malaria with MLB. This slide shows the contribution from both parties, MLB and MTPC. MLB provide uh, MLB drives our project uh, using their anti-malaria research networks. And uh, this uh, is uh, explained in next slide. On the other hand, 
we MTBC provide our facilities to assist it, mainly chemistry aspects, such as computational drug design, absolute configuration determination, and et cetera. Though chemical structure cannot be shown, uh, our compound has amide structure consisted of uh, aromatic amines. So aromatic amine annulates may be generated by metabolic degradations. It is well known that uh, many, uh, many of aromatic amines are genotoxic. In order to overcome the genotoxic risk, we provide mutagenicity, pro uh, mutagenicity prediction calculation for prioritization of specific target, and if necessary, mutagenicity assessment. It is the most important thing is that we MLB and MTPC mutually discuss and determine our project direction, including compound design and so on. This slide illustrates our supported partners of MMB Global Networks. You can easily understand that we are working together all over the world to create new malaria medicines. It looks completely different for our other international medicine project for me. I'd like to brief introduction for our spring library. Though I can't show chemical structure, it contains a lot of unique real life compounds based on state-of-art library compound design. There are two key features. FSP3 is a matrix for three-dimensionality. According to these papers, uh, 3D-shaped compounds are more soluble than flat-type ones. CNSMPO is an index showing the physical chemical properties suitable for uh, central nervous system drugs. Since CNS is one of the most interesting therapeutic areas for MTPC, so our library contains many CNS-like property compounds. Highly permeable CNS-like compounds might be suitable for such kind of phenotypic screenings. And then I'd like to introduce the NDI MTPC collaboration. Hit two lead research have been just started in this April. Our collaboration structure is similar with that of MMB. In the experience of the NDI, the probability of success to deliver the lead optimization stage from the hit two lead is not high, nearly less than 10%. But I believe we can achieve our collaboration to uh, lead optimization stage. Since a lot of kind of uh, unique chemotype hit series have been identified. Uh, I would like to express my appreciation to everyone who is working together and all um, pro all studies are supported by the hit fund. Thank you for kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Kano-san, for your really detailed presentation about your collaboration work with MMB and also other PDPs such as the DNDI. It was very helpful to, to see what you have achieved so far. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we would like to um, move on to the panel discussion. Um, we are a bit behind the schedule, but we'll try to um, have the, the some of the discussions um, with all the panelists today. So if you could put your camera on for all the panelists. Okay, thank you, that's perfect. So I would like to throw up my first question to um, the Japanese partners. So I'll probably start with uh, Nozaki Sensei. So, and um, then I would um, have the same question to Kano-san as well. So my question is, what was the biggest change to you after collaborating with MMV? So what was the impact um, of collaborating with MMV? So I would like to ask uh, Nozaki-sensei first. Sure, sure. Um, 
Right. Uh, as, as I told in my presentation, MMV really give us a good uh, uh, direction. And the, well, they basically uh, is like a compass. Uh, so, so we need MMV as a, as a partner, uh, definitely uh, uh, for, for this in the sailing or, or mountaineering or whatever you call it, and, and for the drug discovery. Without them, you know, we are often lost and we don't have enough network and we don't know enough number of people who have expertise in different areas. So they are compass. Thank you. Yes, it is very nice word to say compass. Yes, I really like that, ex that wording. Thank you so much, Nodaki Sensei. So I would like to have the same question to Kano-san. So what was the biggest change to you after collaborating with MMV? Uh, I have uh, share our uh, collaboration result for our internal uh, meetings. Uh, researchers, in particular, young researchers, are in, very interested in in this collaboration research. And there are many people who are interested in social contributions, such as the SDGs, but uh, they didn't know what can do or what should do. We research at pharmaceutical company have a uh, mission to create new drugs. It is very rewarding to research scientists for pharmaceutical companies that is not only job or mission, but social contribution or con, uh, contribution for global health. For my impression, uh, as I shown the map, the world map, it's very exciting to collaborate with uh, all partners in all over the world. Thank you so much, Kano-san, for your words. Thank you. And um, my next question would be to James. Um, so how did GHIT impact MMB's R&D work and portfolio? I think you have kind of uh, touched, up, touched up on it uh, in your presentation as well, but it would be great if you could give uh, some additional words. No, no, I'd, I'd love to. I mean, I think it, it is really obvious. If you, if you look at the historical MMV portfolio before and after uh, uh, the GHIP fund coming into existence, and you look at the number of projects that we had with Japanese partners before and after, the, the, the difference is day and night. And, and it's that, that transformational change that we've had to our portfolio and the projects and the partners um, that, that you've enabled. And I don't think anyone in MMV believes that we would have been able to uh, make that transition from having, you know, one or two Japanese projects to having tens of Japanese projects that really are some of the most exciting projects in our portfolio without the G -Hit, uh, the G -Hit fund. And it's not just the, 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 the direct funding of the projects, it's, it's actually building the bridges between MMV and, and the Japanese partners. Um, both in terms of the, the framework that we all have within PDPs, but most importantly, in terms of the language, the culture, the ways of working, building that relationship um, with someone actually who understands the environment they're working in much better than MMV do is just being critical for that. So I, I think, I think the, the, the change is clear. Thank you so much for your direct message. And uh, maybe, uh... Kay, do you have any comments from the GHIT side? Um, sure, Eriko, thank, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, all the pa panelists, James and Nozaki Sensei and Kano-san, um, they have captured every, uh, almost in everything, so I'm not, uh, I don't have much to add, but I just wanted to, uh, wanted to come back to the point that James uh, made in his presentation that before GHIT's establishment, uh, there has been you know, a limited number of partnerships between uh, MMV and, and Japanese entities. Um, so that really highlights the fact that we as a GHIT um, serve as a catalytic entity to really connect um, MMV with uh, Japanese counterparts, um, be it academia, universities, research organizations, and you know, farm sort of companies. So uh, we're very much uh, delighted uh, to have been able to connect these um, uh, counterparts and entities together and to, to, to advance innovations uh, for global health R&D. So, 
just want to take this opportunity to thank all the entities and also very much excited to uh, you know explore uh, new potential potential opportunities uh, with existing and also new uh, partner organizations that are present um, today so thank you thank you Kay, for your comments thank you so we have some a uh, couple of minutes left for this panel discussion so i would like to um sort of ask an, an, another question that we at, at this time at this time we cannot really avoid so what was the impact of COVID-19 to your work and combat against malaria so i think james has already um included um, some information in your presentation but probably i would like to start asking from our japanese partners so i'd like to start from uh, nozaki sensei again so did you have any impact of COVID-19 to your work and uh, research activities? Yeah, well, yes, uh, one, one impact is the uh, for a chemical synthesis, for, for instance, the uh, Nagoya Institute of Technology is taking part in. Uh, I think we have difficulty recruiting, recruiting nice, a good uh, foreign uh, chemists overseas. Uh, that's one impact, uh, you know, due to the limitations of uh, troubles across the border. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is the well, I well we miss you know seeing uh, people at MMB. I know is, we are always doing uh, the uh, chatting uh, online, but the uh, to be honest, we've never seen them. You know, except for one occasion with the uh, uh, with uh, Paul Willis at the uh, R and D uh, forum. So so that's the only time we, we saw them. So so. Face sometimes face to face conversations and having dinner, having drink together, it really help us to 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 sort of the uh, energize us. So so that's something missing. Uh, the other thing is the uh, maybe I don't know how much the uh, C our CROs are uh, responsible for uh, chemical synthesis is affected. For instance, in India, so I I'm sure that they are heavily affected by COVID nineteen pandemic. So that's that the like, like three ways that we are affected. And above all that, you know, our staff, students and uh, faculty members are also affected by this, sort of depressed by, by this COVID-19 situation. So, so we are affected, you know, definitely, but we try not to delay the project. So we, we try, we are trying our best. That's all for me. Thank you, Nozaki Sensei. Yes, I think we all miss seeing each other. And I have to admit that I have not seen none of you um, until today so far, actually. I've, I've joined uh, GHIT right after the COVID started. So I've only met you virtually. So I really love to have a time to meet you all uh, at some point, maybe next year. So, <laughs> thank you. So I would like to have the same question to Kano-san as well. So did you have any impact to COVID-19? My answer is almost the same as the question say, but uh, of course, our project was uh, delayed by the COVID-19 influence, but uh, in CRO India is um, more active than I expected. And, and, and they are very um, active, uh, I, than I consider. So of course the delay was uh, um, um, several months delay is occurred, but not so serious uh, effect for uh, for my project, I think. Thank you so much. Yes, it is very interesting to hear that um, the R and D work actually didn't stop as much as we expected, but yes, still. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But still, yes, we do have some impacts. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe James, and I know you've um, talked about it a little in your presentation as well, but um, if you could also give maybe additional words about the impact of COVID-19 to your work. Yeah, of course. Um, and I think in my presentation, maybe I talked more about the, the, the you know, the, 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 the impact on, on, on case numbers and diagnosis and treatment. I suppose in, in an R&D setting and in, certainly in a discovery setting, there obviously was impact. You know, we have a large number of, 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 of collaborators in even in, in area regions of the world that are affected by, uh, you know, significantly affected by uh, COVID, um, South America, 
uh, in the and, and so on. Um, and we also have a lot of collaborators, such as academic institutes, which were were closed. Um, however, so we obviously had some impact, but I think it is probably a strength of the collaborative network model that, that we have within the PDPs that actually meant that, that although at any one time an institution might not be running its assay or it may be asked to do other testing, you know, that's more related to COVID-19, so it can't focus on malaria. But because we had this network of assays, we always had some parts that were working. Um, so um, although the, the, the machine did slow down, there was still producing data, still making compounds and still testing compounds. So actually, I think it was, the model wasn't designed <laughs> to be, uh, um resilient to, to to global pandemics i don't think i don't think any um, you know i don't think that anyone designing our network was thinking of that um but that was uh, a, a benefit of this model was that we were still able to keep operating and and i agree with all the sentiments that you said about actually missing the face-to-face -face contact and actually building those relationships but we were the, the fact of having this global network meant that the idea of collaborating virtually and remotely was, was already um, part of the project team and a part of our way of working. So in that sense, we had a lot of, without knowing it, we had a lot of the tools available that enabled us to keep, keep going. And, and I think the final point I would make, I, and I think this is so important, is that um, the, the, the commitment of the project teams and all of the partners on the mission and seeing the, the necessity to keep working on malaria uh, and the importance of this disease area and, and the just capable motivated to keep working even though the, the situation was difficult. So, so that, that would be my, it affected us, but uh, we were resilient. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, I think your um, sort of, it was, not really planned for this COVID pandemic, but I think your strategy of having the global network and having the laboratories all over the world has actually helped you to sort of keep, keep the movement, the momentum going for your research. So, which is um, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So more that I would love to continue this discussion, um, we are uh, getting into the time for the Q&A session. So thank you so much again for, um, for your comments and discussion for the panel discussion. Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, pick up some questions that we received during this webinar. So I will we'll try to answer as much as possible, but let's see how much time we have. Um, the first question we have received is um, to James. So does MMV have a preference in terms of Japanese partner for a collaboration? No. Like a farmer or academia? No, we don't have a preference at all. Um, we, we really recognize that, um, that uh, this the skills that for example professor nagazaki has in terms of uh, the parasitology uh, are valuable as are the the the, the skills that kanisan has in terms of drug discovery in a in a pharmaceutical setting we like people who have uh, you know compound new novel compounds we like people who have natural products so no there's there there is there is room for everyone <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James. Yes, it, that is very good to hear. And the next question would be to Kay. So we have a question. Um, is it mandatory to have PDPs as a, as a partner when applying to GHIT, um, especially for the late stage products? Um, Kay, do you have, um, could you provide an answer to that question? Um, sure. Thank you, Erica. Um, that is a really important question, and my apology that I wasn't able to cover that in my presentation. So, um, so the answer is uh, we have actually four platforms, um, and for for our investment making mechanism. So, 
Um, I think James covered that in his presentation, but as, um, starting from discovery to, uh, towards the late stage, uh, we have target research platform, uh, screening platform, and heat to lead platform, and then the final one is going to be the product development platform. Um, so the ones, in, uh, the, the ones in between, uh, uh, namely the screening platform and heat to lead platform, uh, for those platforms, it is mandatory to have uh, one of the, you know, uh, three PDPs. Uh, in the case of malaria, it's going to be uh, MMV. Uh, so it's going to be mandatory to have PDP as a collaborator uh, for screening heat to lead um, platforms. Uh, but for the rest of two um, platforms, uh, namely the, the target target research platform and the product development platform, it is not uh, required to have PDP as a collaborator. So that's also part of the reason that um, in my presentation, there are some um, projects that are based on the collaborations with Japanese entities with uh, non PDP um, entities, so to speak. Uh, but as you as you recall, uh, many of the uh, the projects are based on the partnerships between PDPs, and it is uh, uh, based on the fact that you know PDPs like MMV have a uh, you know, long time experience and expertise in this uh, particular disease. So for that reason, I think it would be really worthwhile considering at least uh, speaking to or discussing with uh, major PDPs, um, uh, depending on you know what what sort of uh, disease you're looking uh, looking at. So. Uh, that'll be my, my answer. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about our investment opportunities, all the, uh, the relevant information are available on our website. So it'd be really great if you can take a look, uh, look at our website for further information. And if something is unclear, uh, please do uh, let us know. The contact email address is available on our website. So we definitely look forward to hearing um, uh, from you. So back to Erica. Thank you, Kay, for explanation and introduction for uh, the GHIT funding. So um, I have one interesting question to um, Professor Nozaki, Nozaki-sensei. So I'm a student doing a research on malaria, and I'm interested in pursuing a career in R&D in academia. Um, could you please give me an advice? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult, difficult one. one. Well, <laughs> so, 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 so I don't know if he, that student is, is being engaged with the drug development per se, or he, he's doing something else. But I strongly recommend you to pursue your higher education, so maybe PhD uh, or postdoc in the laboratory, which has a good a partnership with PDP. Uh, at least, uh, uh, if he or she is not ready to jump into the pharmaceutical in industry at this stage, because you know my my student, for instance, in my department at the University of Tokyo, they have a certain level of exposure to to James and and, and Paul and MMB and also with the people with the uh, DNDI, for instance, and this sort of constant uh, uh, exposure. And really giving, I feel that they, it, it, this interaction is really giving boost to the young researcher. So this is sort of the echoing comments with Colonel Sun's uh, previous comments, but they, you know, they seem to be very motivated and they, they really feel uh, drug development in, even in, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry seems to be very close to them. So this may really benefit the pharmaceutical industries in the long, long term, in my opinion. That, that, that's my comments to that question. So, so come to the laboratory who has uh, an existing collaboration with MMB. <laughs> Not necessarily my laboratory, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nozaki Sensei, for the kind answer. Um, maybe uh, we are just uh, getting towards the end of the session. Um, so um, thank you for all your questions. And I'd like to move on to the closing of this session. So um, I'm very sorry if we were not able to answer uh, some of your questions that you have submitted. And um, maybe I'd like to ask uh, just a few words, maybe 30 seconds um, from each of the panelists as a closing wording. So if um, Kano-san could start. Uh, this is um, this is a good experience uh, to introduce our activities. Thank you for um, kind attention. Thank you, Kano-san. Um, Nozaki-sensei? 
Sure. Um, as a parasitologist in academia, I really want to encourage the Japanese young researchers, uh, not in the academia only, but all the industries are getting interested in drug development for the uh, infectious disease for the poor. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Nozaki Sensei. And James? Yes, I would just like to thank you for the opportunity to, to speak at this forum. I would like to thank you for the, you know, for the support that, that GHIT and all of our partners, past, present and, and future, have, have provided to us. Um, you know, we enjoy working with you and look forward to working with you in the future. Um, it, you know, everything that we've done is, to get, is done together. So thank you very much. Thank you, James. And um, maybe from Kay as well. Uh, sure, I'll be really quick. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists and also the participants uh, for the uh, webinar today. And I definitely look forward to exploring potential opportunities in the coming uh, month or uh, year. So thanks again. Thank you. And thank you all again uh, for the great discussion and the presentation today. Um, Dr. Duff, uh, James Duffy from MMV, Professor Nozaki from the University of Tokyo, uh, Mr. Kano from Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma Corporation, and Kei Katsuno from GG Hit Fund. So uh, lastly, please allow me to share some information before the closing of this webinar. Sorry, we are uh, at the end of the time, but please give me one more minute. So uh, we are also plan. So this is a webinar series. So we are planning um, additional sessions with other PDPs, and uh, session two will be held in October, um, staring with uh, DNDI. And uh, please stay tuned for them for more information for in our website. Um, after this webinar has been closed, um, some a questionnaire will be sent to you. So it would be really appreciated if you could take two minutes of your time to fill this questionnaire to improve our webinar for the coming session. Thank you again for taking your time today and joining um, our very first webinar uh, from the multiple regions. And we look really looking forward to seeing you in our web next webinar as, as well. Thank you so much. Goodbye and have a nice evening or the rest of the day. <laughs>